All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to First Church of the Nazarene. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. I have a favor to ask you to sing loud this morning because I'm a little under the weather, okay? So it's your turn to sing out today. <laughs> Let's stand as we begin our worship this morning with Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. The Lord of Israel said, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, and the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The sovereign Lord comes with power, and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him, and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. December of 2018. I'm okay with December, just not of 2018. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence with us today. And as we come into this place, I know that we come in from a lot of different weeks. For a number of people in this congregation, this has been a very difficult week with the loss of someone they deeply love. For many in this congregation, it's been a, a very different difficult week for many other reasons. But as we come into this place today, I pray that you will help us to be a place of refuge, a place where we come in and we sense your presence and we sense your peace, and all of the, the overwhelming realities of life can be set aside for a time as we focus on you and we're strengthened and we're energized by your love for us. I pray that you will help us as we come into this time today to focus on you and to hear what you would say to each of us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. And you may be seated. Well, we do have a number of announcements as we get started today. Uh, first of all, the Hanging of the Greens will be tonight at 6 p.m. So we would encourage you to come back. We'll have a meal and we'll have uh, probably a brief service and just take some time to decorate the church, get it ready for Christmas. Also in the foyer is our directory. Uh, we're updating that. We do that about once a year. So if you are new to us within the last year, make sure your information is, is in there. Um, we don't give this to anybody that's going to contact you and sell you anything. It's just so that we can, we can communicate um, with, with you and uh, others in the church can communicate with you. 
Um, so make sure that you get, uh, get that directory information updated. We'll be printing the new directories after the first of the year. Also, this Thursday, we are going to be trying something new. We're going to be doing a mobile food drop. Uh, so we have the uh, Riverbend Food Bank, who is going to come in and bring a food pantry in a truck. And they'll be here Thursday morning. And we need some volunteers to help us with that. So if you're interested in helping with that, it'll be Thursday morning. There's details in your bulletin. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Uh, Mary Atkins is kind of overseeing this, and, and she may be here this morning a little bit later. She's been feeling sick since she returned from California. Uh, but we're going to be uh, um, doing this on Thursday, so we'd love to have your help if you're available. Also, um, we are replacing our church vans. They're 13 years old and um, up there in miles and up there in maintenance costs, so we are upgrading them. Um, in large part because our insurance company said there's safer vans that you need to get instead of the old ones that you're driving. Um, so if you would like to contribute to that, it uh, looks like our cost is going to be somewhere around uh, eleven to, to $13,000 that we're looking at after our trading on our current vans. So if you'd like to contribute to that, just mark church van. Also, um, church finances. Just a, an FYI, an update, a plea. When we have to cancel services like we did last Sunday um, because of weather, it does impact our church financially. We, we have to pay the electric bill whether we're here to enjoy it or not, and we have to pay the snowplow bill so we can get in this week. So if you're able to give what you would have given last week, we would greatly appreciate that. And also, if, you're, um, if you haven't seen our new website, we did put up a new church website this week, and I would encourage you to check that out sometime over the next week probably while I'm preaching and you're bored. But with that, let's stand together as we continue to worship.
we come to this time in our service, we, uh, we have a number of prayer requests this week. We have several families who have lost loved ones in the last few weeks. Lindsay Rubin's brother passed away, I believe, yesterday. Judy Caker passed away about on Thanksgiving Day. And Mary Tremble, who worshiped with us for a number of years, passed away the day before Thanksgiving. It's been a rough week for a lot of people, a lot of rough time. And there's also a lot of other requests, a lot of people fighting battles and health concerns, job concerns. When we come to this time of our service, it really is a sacred time, not because of us or this place, but because our God has called us to come boldly before the throne with confidence with whatever we're facing. And so we're going to sing through this chorus again. And if you want to be seated, you can be seated. If you want to remain standing, if you want to come forward, our altars are open. If you would like special prayer, Pastor Barry and I will be up front. So just take advantage of this opportunity to bring before God whatever you're facing, whatever's weighing heavily on you today. As we sing through this chorus again. I'm falling on my knees Offering all of me Jesus, you're all this heart is living for I'm falling on my knees serve a God who cares to hear what's going on. Very thankful that we serve a God who sees us no matter what we're facing and loves us and walks alongside of us. Even when our emotions and our, our realities are so, such that we feel like we can't even say anything. You are there in those moments and as the Apostle Paul says, you can interpret our groanings. You do understand what we're saying. And Father, I pray as we come into this place today for all of those who are facing the realities of grief. And I know that this has been a, a very rough stretch for our church. We've had a number of people pass away this fall. We continue to pray for Susan Finnick and the loss of Dave. We pray for Baker family and the loss of Judy and the Trimble family and the loss of Mary and the Zaruba family and the loss of Wayne. Father, there's so many so many needs. People in different stages of grief and we thank you that you are there with them. And Father, for those who are fighting health battles, we continue to pray for Tad and his fight with cancer. We pray for Justin Raymond Jr. this morning and the issue that he's facing is he's in the hospital with challenges to his spleen and three cysts and, and restricted blood flow. We just pray that you'll be with, with Jr. this morning and be with his family as they surround him. And Father, we, we just ask that you would be at work in this situation. And Father, for many other situations, those who are facing challenges with their health, recovering from surgeries, those who are facing challenges at work, those who are facing challenges in their finances, those who are facing challenges in relationships. Father, we thank you that no matter what we're facing in this world, no matter how overwhelming things may seem, that you are able to speak hope, you are able to speak love, you are able to speak peace into our lives and our situations. And Father, as we begin this month of December, as we in the church celebrate the, the beginning of Advent, we're reminded of that, that concept of Advent, that, that longing for what is to come. We 
easily get that confused with Christmas, and that's not what Advent is about. Advent is, is longing for, anticipating the coming one. Both what was anticipated when he came the first time, but also our anticipation of the coming the second time. Father, I know that there are a lot of situations in our world, there's a lot of situations in our, in our community where we're just, we anticipate when you come to make all things right. But in the meantime, help us to live in such a way that we represent your kingdom here, that we represent your kingdom now. Not because we think we're good enough to do that, but because that's how your son taught us to pray. And we join in that prayer today. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And you may be seated. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ
Will you stand with us? I lift my hands. Be still. There is a healer. His love is deeper than the sea. And his mercy is unfailing. His arms a fortress for the weak. Let pain Lord, thank you for being with us in your Holy Spirit and for our fellowship together. Thank you for your love, grace, mercy, blessings, and guidance, and for all that you do for everyone in this world every day in every way. Please bless our offering today. For all power, honor, praise, and glory is yours forever. Amen.
for this morning is the first Sunday of Advent. And Advent is not just Christmas, although sometimes we get those confused. Advent is the looking forward with hope. The looking forward to something coming. And in this case, we look forward to the coming of our Lord. There are two ways that Advent is applied. The first way is is recognize that, that during this time of the church year, we look forward through our rearview mirror at the first coming of Jesus Christ and, and what it meant for him to, to come into this broken world and to be born as, as an infant and how he brought hope. And next week we'll talk about love and joy and peace into this broken world. But we're also to be reminded during this time of year, not just of that first coming, but we're to be reminded that He's coming again. He's coming again to make all things right. All that's messed up in our world, and it doesn't take long to see things messed up in our world, that He's coming to make all of those things right. And so this first Sunday of Advent, our theme is the concept of hope. Now we're in our first week of Advent, but we're also finishing up our year with Jesus. And as we're finishing up this year in Jesus, we've, with Jesus, we've spent the year in the Gospels. And we've spent all of this year looking at who Jesus was and how He interacted in the world. How he interacted with people that disagreed with him. How he shaped those that followed him, those that loved him. And we, we try to merge these two together, which isn't as hard as sometimes it gets in my mind. But we're looking forward with full knowledge of the first coming. And we're look, looking forward with eager anticipation of the second. Now, this week in our reading, we covered a number of stories. I, I really wish we could have taken the time to read through all of these stories this morning. But I really felt led to look at one of these stories in particular. But it's one of those stories that if you were reading with us, probably was a little bit baffling. Because right at the end of John chapter 7, verse 52, in between verse 52 and verse 53, there's a statement. It says that the, the following passage does not show up in our oldest manuscripts. In fact, some Bibles have taken this passage out of Scripture. And I want to talk a little bit about why that would be. We have included it in ours. Um, but why would... What, what's this saying? When we look at this passage, John chapter 7, verse 53, through John chapter 8, verse 11... This is a very unique passage of Scripture. The way that the translation process took place, the Bible that we have today, it wasn't written in this format. It was written on scrolls, and it was written in a multitude of languages. Hebrew for most of the Old Testament, although some of it was written in Aramaic, what we have. The New Testament was written in a combination of Greek and Aramaic. And those were translated, and scrolls, tended to not last very long. So when your scroll would wear out, you would have to buy another scroll. You would have to have it copied. And when you wanted to share a copy with your friend, there wasn't just a button at the bottom of the page that said share this. And you could have put it on Facebook or Instagram or email. You had to actually copy it down. And someone was paid a good salary and it took about a year for them to copy Scripture. So they were paid a year's salary to handwrite from one scroll to the next. The Scripture that we have came through a progression of those scrolls being copied and recopied and recopied. And there are a couple of verses that show up in some of our older translations that probably were not included in the original, but they were side notes. Now, my Bible, um, I, I tend to mark my Bible up quite a bit. In fact, I have to replace my Bible about every th 
three or four years because I've written so much in it that when I'm reading it to prepare sermons, I can't see past what I saw the first time. And so I have to get a new one, so I'm looking at a, at a fresh slate. Sometimes when somebody was hand copying their scroll, and they would be, oh, halfway through, and they would forget a verse. And they would mark that in the margins and draw an arrow. And sometimes when they were copying, they would make a note about something and draw a line. And it's hard for us to know which was which. So some things, some verses, in fact, there was a passage that we looked at in Luke that a verse was missing. In Luke's gospel, when the Samaritans, when Jesus tells the, or when Jesus tells the Samaritans he's going to Jerusalem and they say, you can't come here. And, and the disciples say, well, can we call down fire from heaven and can destroy them? And Jesus responds, in the original manuscripts, it just says, Jesus rebuked them. There was a note that was added in that said something about Jesus rebuked them and told them that Jesus did not come to destroy but to save the lost. Now, that verse doesn't show up in our translations because it was probably just a note that was added in. This passage that we're looking at this morning is kind of one of those confusing pieces of the translation process. We read our Bibles in English. And just so you know, it wasn't written in, in any way in English. And in case you're wondering, Jesus wasn't white either. Um, we tend to view everything through our lens, but he wasn't white and this wasn't written in English. So here's this story. The earliest manuscripts that we have, the first 200 years worth of manuscripts that we have of John's gospel, this passage is not included. Some of them have an eerie space in this section, but not all of them do. And this has baffled scholars for years. This passage that we're looking at actually doesn't just show up in this location. This passage shows up in three different places throughout John's Gospel in different manuscripts. And in fact, some of the, the older manuscripts place this story in Luke's gospel. The language that's used, there's a couple of phrases that's used here that are not used anywhere else in John's gospel. So most likely, John didn't write this section of scripture. It doesn't sound like John. It sounds a whole lot like Luke because it's Jesus paying attention to someone who's down and out. But it's, it doesn't sound like John, and I, I don't think hardly anybody believes that it was written by John, any scholars. I call this a passage looking for a home, because that's what the other scholars called it. And one of the early church fathers, in about the year 150, wrote that about this passage. But he referred to it being in a gospel that didn't make it into our Bible. So it was another story that had been written about Jesus. They chose four gospels to include in the Bible that we have. But this story, very possibly, came out of a gospel that didn't make it into the Bible. But it's still very much a true story of Jesus. And so the, the people who wanted this story included in the Bible, but most likely the other gospel... Was, was very redundant, so it, it had everything that was already there except this story. So they said, well, why don't we just take this story and put it in either John or Luke? And that's what they did. Another option, Augustine, who was around four, the year 400, said that this story may have been excluded because it could have been used as an excuse. And so perhaps that eerie space that appears in those scrolls was that some early church leaders didn't like this story. Maybe John did write it, although I think it was probably Luke if one of the, our gospel writers. But because this story lets, shows a little bit too much grace in some people's minds, some have said, Augustine said, that they just pulled it out of the scripture because they didn't want people to think they had an excuse to sin. 
Now, which one of those is true? I don't know. And I'm not smart enough to figure it out. But I will agree with this statement from one of the commentaries that I read. If, there it goes, except it went too far. For most in the church, Protestants and Roman Catholics alike, this pericope or this section of scripture is regarded as being fully canonical, meaning it fully fits within scripture, even though it has been understood by textual scholars for centuries to be out of place. In fact, when I was reading through my commentaries, none of the commentaries put this section of scripture where it goes. The commentaries would go from chapter 7 to, to chapter 8, verse 12. And I would have to go all the way to the back of the commentary to find the commentary on this section. They know it doesn't fit here, but they do believe, and I believe, it is a true story of Jesus. With that being said, let's look at this passage of Scripture. And if you have questions about that, if I've confused you thoroughly, then feel free to, to ask me. You know, the hanging of the greens tonight would be a great time to have that conversation with you. <laughs> you have your Bibles and you want to open up with me to John chapter 8. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered and he said and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Again, I think some scholars thought, or some early church scholars thought, that this passage lets this lady off a bit too easily, and they didn't want this included in scripture for that reason now quite honestly beyond the the issues of where does this text actually belong there are a lot of other questions that this passage brings up the number one question I think of every time I read this text is where's the man a woman can't commit adultery without a man so where's the man and why would they make such a show out of somebody's sin that's another thing that troubles me about this story. Why would you take someone's sin and broadcast it to the entire world? She wasn't a politician. She wasn't running for office. The truth is that these questions are valid questions, but the Bible just doesn't say. The story doesn't give us the answers to these questions. But we're going to look at this from a little bit different angle today. Thinking about Advent and the candle, the first Sunday of Advent being the Sunday of hope, I want you to think about how hopeless this situation would have been for this woman. It's easy for us to read this scripture through the lens of we know how it's going to end, but think about how hopeless this situation would have been for this woman. What was she experiencing as she went through this moment? She was just caught in a sin that in her culture, in that day, the punishment for that sin was death. And not only was she caught, and not only did she face death, but her sin was now exposed to the entire city. Everybody knew this woman's sin. The last bit of dignity was gone. In fact, many scholars speculate that she was probably brought before them as she was found in the, in the act of committing adultery completely nude. That they drug her out of the bed and brought her before the crowds and she was exposed 
for the entire city to see. Every bit of dignity that she faced was gone. And in that culture where this sin was punishable by death, it was not a sin that she committed alone, but she alone was bearing the weight of the sin. Whoever the man was, wasn't exposed to this humiliation. She'd been made a spectacle. And she was being used by the Pharisees for an agenda that she did not understand. It's very possible that this woman, when she was brought before Jesus, had no clue who Jesus was. Why are they bringing me before this man who's not wearing the robes of a rabbi? He's not in the places of judgment, the seats of judgment that typically a person would be brought in front of. Why are they bringing me in front of this man and telling him what I've done and demanding him to pronounce judgment against me. She was being used in so many ways. And she had no clue what was going on. But Jesus did. And I love this story for this reason. That in this situation where this lady was completely hopeless, she had nothing to cling to, probably not even clothes to cover herself with. And in this moment, where she feels the eyes of the world upon her, and all hope is gone. In fact, my guess is she's probably hoping that they kill her quickly because this is so humiliating. But in this moment, Jesus brings hope. He brings hope because he knows who she is. And he's not disgusted by her. Jesus knew who she was created to be. And so he moved to speak hope into this situation. Jesus knew the motives of the Pharisees. He knew they didn't care about justice. He knew they didn't care about this woman. Jesus saw beyond the trap, and he saw the human being. And I think for us today, that in and of itself is a lesson. To see beyond the sin. To see beyond what somebody put on Facebook. For me, to see beyond whoever just cut me off in traffic. And to see the human being. And Jesus responded by kneeling down in the dust. And he just started to doodle. Or maybe he was writing something we don't know. Maybe Jesus chose to kneel down so that the lady wouldn't feel like she was, he was staring at her. But Jesus knelt down and started to write in the dust. Now, whoever it was that wrote this story wrote it in the culture of that day and not our culture because in our culture today, we all want to know what was Jesus writing? Don't tell me that he was writing in the dust and, don't, and not tell me what he was writing. Did he write the sins of the Pharisees? Those who were accusing her? Did he start writing their sins out so that they would see in big, bold letters? what they were guilty of. Did he write the name of the woman? Did he write the name of the man? The truth is we don't know. We don't have a clue what Jesus wrote in the dust. As Jesus was writing in the dust, the message that he was trying to send did not communicate. And the Pharisees kept demanding an answer. They kept pushing and pushing and pushing. They wanted to see 
how they could trick Jesus in this moment. Because here's the dilemma that they put Jesus in. They thought they had him trapped. If Jesus said, she doesn't deserve to die, then in their minds, he's discrediting the whole of the Old Testament. Because he's saying, don't follow the law that was written. If he says, put her to death, then he's just taking something into his hands that according to the Roman law, he didn't have the authority to do. In fact, according to the Roman law, the Pharisees didn't have the authority to do that. Only the Romans could put someone to death in a Roman culture. And so they thought they had Jesus trapped. They thought they had him in a position where either they could discredit him in the minds of the Jewish people Because they would say, he just said don't follow Scripture. He just said ignore the Old Testament. He said ignore what Moses had written. Or, they could take him to the Romans and say, this teacher overstepped his bounds and demanded that this woman be put to death and he didn't have the authority to do it. In either case, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were committed to being tattletales. They just didn't know which story they were going to be able to tattle on. And they thought they had Jesus trapped. And you can almost hear in their voices the excitement building as Jesus continued to kneel and to write in the dust. And they're saying, come on, tell us what what are you going to do? In other words, tell us what we can tell on you for. And Jesus, (laughs) as only Jesus could, stood up and shocked them. He told them to go ahead, but let he who has no sin cast the first stone. In other words, fulfill the law of Moses, but let the one who is perfect be the one to cast the stone. And then, Jesus knelt back down. And he continued writing in the dust. And I know we're not supposed to take wagers on Scripture. But I just have to think that maybe Jesus did start writing some of their sins. And I could be completely wrong. I've been wrong about a lot of things. But Jesus wrote in the dust. And they all left. They put down their stones. And they walked away. And after they were gone, I'm assuming Jesus stood up. Maybe Jesus took off his own outer robe that he usually wore too and handed it to the woman. We don't know. The story doesn't tell us. But there's such compassion in what he says. This is where are your accusers? Have none condemned you? And she said, no. And he said, then neither do I. Now, if the story stopped there, then this could be used as an excuse to go and sin because it really doesn't matter. The story doesn't stop there. Jesus then says to the woman, go. But don't do it again. Go, but sin no more. Don't keep living this life. Go. But don't keep destroying who I created you to be. Is the heart of what Jesus is saying to this woman. I created you for better than this. And my heart breaks to see you in this position. But don't keep living this life. There's something better for you. This story, as we said earlier, probably does not originate in this context. It's probably not where the story 
would have been included in Jesus' ministry. But there are a couple of reasons why this location was probably chosen. First of all, chapter 7 of this, what we were just reading, what we read before this, ends with the crowds ready to stone Jesus. And chapter 8, where this story ends, I believe explains how Jesus wanted to bring hope. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. And then people argue with him. And the next section is the, is the Pharisees telling him, you don't have the authority to say that. How dare you say that you're the light of the world. And then Jesus gives them an answer. And then they argue some more. Jesus tells them, I'm going away. You will search for me, but when I die, but you will die in your sin. You cannot come where I'm going. And they're very confused. And what in the world are you saying? And they argue with him some more. And then he says this in chapter 8, verse 31. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. And you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Now there's an awful lot of arguing that goes on in between these two verses. But I think these two verses, where Jesus says in, in verse 12, I am the light of the world, and if you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness, because you will have the light that leads to life. And in verse 32, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. These two verses sum up what does it take to have hope in a broken, messed up world. First of all, I believe that hope comes from the light. If you've ever been in a situation where it was completely dark and you feel absolutely hopeless, and then a small light comes on. Whether it be a candle, or whether it be a flashlight, or whether it's your cell phone. When a light comes on, there's at least the hope that there's a world beyond this blackness. A world beyond the dark. Because light illuminates where we are. And not only does light illuminate where we are, it also illuminates the path ahead. Although sometimes it just illuminates enough for our next step. The light helps us to know where to go next. And if we're feeling hopeless, then we are desperately looking for that light to tell us what is next. One of the struggles I've had in my journey with Jesus is sometimes when I'm in the place of feeling hopeless and a little bitty light comes on, I really am ready for Jesus just to turn on the light switch and let me see everything that's going to happen. Because I want to know. How's this all going to work out? Where exactly am I and how am I going to get from there to there? And for goodness sakes, how long is it going to take? Because I'm ready to be there now. But on my journey, more times than not, Jesus has just given me the light for the next step. I'm not telling you where this is going, Daniel. But I'm telling you that that's the next step. I'm not telling you how this is all going to turn out. But I'm telling you that that's your next step. And what the light does is the light at least helps us to see that next step. For some of us this morning, that may be the message that we need to hear. 
And for some of you this morning, you may be in a situation where you feel absolutely overwhelmed because you feel like the lights have turned off and you're absolutely suffocating in the dark. And you may need to hear that Jesus is saying, you don't have to know how this is going to turn out. You just have to know that this is your next step. You don't have to know how long this is going to take. You just need to know that this is your next step. That may be where some of you are at this, this morning. I know I certainly went through some conversations with Jesus this week that had me in that place. Where I wanted to know how something was going to go. I wanted to know how this was going to turn out. And Jesus just said, I'm not telling you that. Put it mildly, he said, it's none of your business. Your business is this step. Your business is this step. But I think all hope also grows in the truth. There's an awful lot to be said about how our sins grow in private. When our sins are hidden in private, it's easy to just keep, keep doing them and nobody knows and nobody knows. And for the woman in this story, who knows how long she had been in this relationship with this unnamed man. But it's easy as long as no one knows to keep doing it. But when it is brought into the truth, then that sin loses that secrecy that keeps it going. When it is brought into the truth, and everybody knows, then the lady was faced with a question. After it turns out that Jesus rescues her in an amazing way, and Jesus says to her, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. Now she has a reputation. Was she going to uphold that reputation? Or was she going to walk in the truth that Jesus exposed to her? Because it wasn't something she could do in secret any longer. The truth was out. There's a lot of wisdom in what Jesus says here. It's spoken to me numerous times in my life. First, we have to know the truth. It's easy for me, with my personality, to assume that I know the truth. It's very easy for me to walk into a situation and observe what's going on, and immediately I can assume what I know the truth to be. Most of the time, I'm wrong. Last night, for example, I walked into the kitchen. We had dinner, and then I came, I came back to the church after dinner, and I went back home. And some of the jam, Sharon Holmes and Bob Holmes gave me some black raspberry jam. Now, if you've never had black raspberries, they're different than red raspberries. They're better. <laughs> and I've kind of been nursing these jars along because I really like it, and Ava found it last night. And I hadn't told the girls it was in the fridge. I was just getting some every once in a while, but not telling them. And so for dinner, Ava found it and ate more than I wanted her to. And then I came home after I'd, I'd been at the church finishing up my sermon. I came back home, and there was that jam sitting on the counter again. It's like, you didn't leave that out, did you? That can't go bad. And Janelle said, no, Ava just got it out for a snack. But she found it. But my immediate assumption was it had been sitting out since dinner. And now I wasn't going to get to enjoy any of what was left. But I was wrong. For me, I'm quick to jump to those conclusions and I see something and, oh, I know what's going on here. I know what's going on here. You just wasted my black raspberry jam. The truth you have to find out the truth. Sometimes that means asking the question. Sometimes that means not jumping to conclusions, but knowing the truth. And then recognizing that in knowing the truth, we can be free. But we cannot be free 
if we're still living in the lies. It was a simple illustration of Blackberry Jam. Had I not asked the question, and I went to eat some of that jam that had now been setting out in my speculation several hours, well, now is it safe to eat? I don't know. But in asking the question, albeit with an accusing tone, there's freedom. And sometimes we need to stop jumping to conclusions. And I think a lot of times we need to stop believing what we see on the internet. Even though I know Abraham Lincoln said that everything you see on the internet is true. Sometimes we need to stop believing what we see on the internet. And quite honestly, sometimes we need to stop believing what we see on the news. And as Jesus reminded us in, these story, in this story, see the human being. And perhaps that's the message that you need to hear this morning. It's definitely one that I have to be reminded of very frequently. To not get so caught up in my assumptions, but to seek to know the truth. Because hope cannot grow unless there is truth. So how do we apply that to us today? Are, are you feeling hopeless today? There's a couple questions that we draw from this passage. First of all, are we spending time in the light? If we're feeling hopeless, are we spending time with the light? And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Are we spending time reading His Word and hearing what He has to say? Because it's easy for us to feel hopeless. Let me rephrase that. It's easy for me to feel hopeless if I feel like I have to figure it all out by myself. But when I spend time with Jesus, then all of a sudden things come back into perspective. And He starts to show me what that next step is. Usually not the big picture, but the next step. And then Jesus said, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teaching. So if we're feeling hopeless and we're spending time with Jesus, then we have to ask ourselves, are we following Jesus? Are we obeying what we're seeing when we're reading the word? And then the question is, are we living in the truth? Or are we jumping to our assumptions? Are we failing to see what the truth is? because we're so concerned with what we think. Jesus came to bring hope. He came to bring hope to this woman who we don't even know her name. And Jesus came to bring hope to you today. And as our worship team comes, we're going to sing the song. Actually, I'm going to switch the clothes. We're going to do living hope as the closer we sang that for a few minutes ago. Maybe we need to be reminded today that Jesus is the light and he's giving us the next step and we need to just follow the next step. And maybe we need to be reminded today to live in the truth and not in our assumptions. And maybe we need to be reminded we need to see the people, the humans, not just our judgments. I don't know which of those messages God wanted you to hear today. I think for me, I need to be reminded of all three of them. And it may be a completely different message that God has spoken to you today, and I'm okay with that too. But as we begin this season of Advent, as we think about what it means for Jesus to be our hope. I want you to ask yourself the question, am I spending time in the light? Am I living faithfully to what I'm learning? And am I living the truth? Let's stand together as we close this song. <laughs> Sure.
for sending your son into this world to bring hope. Thank you for the hope that he instilled deeply in those that he lived with, walked with, ministered to, and for the hope that we find in reading of these stories. But Father, I also thank you that the hope doesn't stop there, but that we do have hope of your coming again, and we eagerly anticipate when you will make all things right. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you are dismissed.